been going through the Right Now Media study, thanks Jeremiah, by Francis Chan with us through the book of James. Maybe your life group has been going through it. Um, the way that he starts off this week's video on these six verses in James chapter 5, he gives us this warning that it can be easy to read these six verses and think that it doesn't apply to us. <laughs> That's the first thing that he says. But uh, these words, I believe this morning, they can get to our hearts. They can get to our minds. These things can apply to us and give us a bigger picture of um, how God has given us some things in this life that are for his purposes and for his glory. So if your life group is going through it this week, get ready. It's convicting. It's a great video resource and it's going to be a great, hopefully an encouraging time um, with your life group this week. If your life group isn't studying this and going through this series right now in your group, that, that's okay. I would still encourage you as an individual um, to watch the, these videos from Francis Channel Right Now Media. There's discussion questions online and it's a great individual resource. And if in this season of life right now during this semester you're not in a life group, uh, we hope that changes and will help you see <laughs> why it's important to be connected with others in a group. But um, if you're not able to be right now, I would still encourage you to watch these resources, watch these videos, uh, reflect on the questions. These, video, these teaching videos are about eight minutes long, and uh, the questions are great to think on throughout the, the, throughout the week. And um, So if you would like a free Right Now Media account, we have this through our church. We'd love to give that to you, access that, or you can access that. And so send us a, an email, send us a note, connect with us, even on our website. If you click on the I'm New tab, um, on that page, you can click on the Right Now Media uh, image and you'll be able to receive that free account that not only has this series on the Book of James, but so many other video series, devotionals, video devotionals that are so, can be so helpful for personal as well as corporate uh, study and reflection. So Francis, he begins making that claim that um, it can be really easy to bypass these six verses and think it doesn't apply to us. And the reason is because James was writing this specific passage of his letter to owners, to business owners, to landowners, to people who were in charge of employees. And so for many of us, we're, we're employees. We're not employers. We don't own anything. We work for someone. Maybe we're a manager, but we're not in charge of setting their wage or we don't, you know, we're not the, the top person. So for a lot of us, it can easy, be easy to gloss over what James is talking about saying, well, I'm not, I'm not in charge. I'm not making those decisions. Yet this passage can be applied to how our hearts view money, how our hearts view what God has given us with time, how our hearts view the skills and abilities, the talents that God has given us. We can, we can apply James's words to our lives today, even if we are not in charge of people in a workplace setting. And so as we continue in this series called A Faith That Works through the book of James, here's our big idea for the morning. It's the one thing that you and I will be able to get from this passage of scripture, and it's this. It's that my faith compels my heart to generosity. My faith compels my heart to generosity. You know, when we believe in Jesus, we make a commitment to, to Jesus in saying, hey, you're in charge. What you say goes, I, I, I'm thankful that you died for me, that you saved me, that you rose again for me. And so I want to put you in charge of every aspect of our life. We want to experience this new life in Jesus Christ is what we talk about here at Avenue. And, and the way that we can accomplish that and help other people accomplish that is by helping them connect to Jesus, become like Jesus, and proclaim Jesus over their lives. So when we talk about proclaiming Jesus over our lives, many, many times we think of a proclamation of faith. Like, hey, I made a decision to trust in Jesus, my Lord and Savior. Or I made a decision to, to be baptized in front of my church family as a public proclamation of my faith. Or many times we think of proclaiming Jesus over our lives as something that we just did. We, we sing a song of worship. We are declaring that Jesus, you're in charge. We're, we're only singing to you. We're not singing to anyone else but you, Jesus. But what sometimes we forget is when we proclaim Jesus over our lives, 
It means that we're putting him in charge of every aspect of our life. We're giving him the, the keys to drive. We're giving him full leadership. We're giving him full reign over every aspect of our life. And this morning, what we'll see is how James is speaking to not only the church back then, but to us today as to how we can proclaim Jesus over every aspect of our life, our, our time, our, our talent, and our treasure. So let's look at James chapter 5, starting in verse 1. If you have a Bible in the seat back in front of you, it's on page uh, 979, I want to say, correct? And so grab your, if you have a Bible on your phone, grab that out. Verses are going to be up on our screen throughout the morning. So James chapter 5, starting in verse 1, let's, let's look at these first three verses together. He writes this, Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth has rotted. Moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. It's a pretty gruesome and kind of grotesque <laughs> image that, that James paints to these rich people, to the people in charge. And, and what you see is that the wealth that they have, as it says in verse 2, has rotted away. The moths have eaten their clothes. If you remember, within this, within this culture, if you were wearing nice clothes, it was because you were extremely rich. In, in our day and age, anyone can wear nice clothes and have nice clothes, and it doesn't necessarily reflect someone's income level. In that day and age, only the richest of the rich would have nice clothing. And what he's saying is, you bought all this nice clothing, you've been hoarding these wealth, and it's deteriorating. It's going away. You thought it would be something that would bring value and joy to your life, but it's doing the exact opposite. And then in verse 3, your gold and silver are corroded. Gold and silver don't do that. Gold and silver don't corrode over time. And so the, the, the picture he's painting is that you've hoarded all this wealth. You've, you've had it sit there in your, in your home, and your treasury, whatever it is, and it's doing absolutely nothing for you. You thought this would give you life, having all this gold and silver. Instead, it's doing the opposite. And to take it a step further, he says, it's against you, and it's eating your flesh like fire. <laughs> it's in there and it's burning your flesh. It's deteriorating your soul and your life. See, what was happening is that he was talking specifically to the people, maybe who were coming, who were newer to the faith. And they liked this thing about Jesus, but they still found their value, their significance, and their focus in life was on what they had was on their possessions, was on their wealth, was on making money. It's a very vivid picture that James is painting, that not only for these rich people, but just for the church in general, who was sometimes being led astray, thinking that if they put the rich in charge, the rich could help them get them out of their poverty, and then things would be okay. And he's saying that's not the case at all. If you put your trust in money and accumulating wealth to help you feel better, to to get you out of something you're going through, to find value, significance, and, and purpose in life because of what you have, it's going to do the exact opposite. And so the anecdote, or the antidote to being selfish, to hoarding, is generosity. See, when we live generously, we're not worried about, well, do I have enough money? <laughs> Am I saving enough money? Um, am I living comfortably? Is my money making me fulfilled and satisfied in life? When we're living generously, when we're thinking generously, when our hearts are compelled to be generous because of, the, because of looking at the example of our generous God who generously gave up his son Jesus in our place, then we no longer are focused on finding purpose and value and significance in what we have, but in how God wants us to use it to be generous and a blessing to others. Their hearts back then were so concerned so concerned by, about having enough. They were so concerned about having the appearance of having enough. And like I said, we can easily gloss over this, but it just so happened that about two years ago, we were in the toilet paper, whatever you want to call it, craze heist of, of 2020, whatever it was. That, you know, there's no toilet paper, grocery stores are empty, water, water is gone. It just, I mean, it was insane how in those two weeks, and there was so much fear and uncertainty that was going on. We can laugh about it now, and we've seen how things, but, but in that moment, 
for many of us, there was this, this fear of, am I going to have enough? Am I going to get through this? I need to make sure that I think about me, myself, and I before anyone else. And we can look back on that and, and, and laugh about it now. And, and yet, even today, we see the inflation continuing to increase. Gas, oil prices are increasing. We don't know when that's going to turn around. No matter any point in human history, there are going to be times where outside circumstances will reveal our heart's view of money, of treasure here on this earth. And so in this first time together where we're going to spend some moments just to reflect, what I want to do is this. I'm gonna, we're going to have some verses, Bible verses, that are just scrolling on the screens. And we're going to scroll through them a couple times. And I just want you to, to read them. And if there's maybe one verse uh, from, from God's word that really speaks to you about your, your heart, where your heart's at about money and resources and, and your treasure here on this earth, your perspective on it, ask God to speak to you, reveal to you any selfishness and ask God to reveal to you any steps that you need to take in being generous. We, we've talked in this series, and James talks a lot about money and resources because it was a big issue the churches he's writing to. So we've talked about giving and, and why we give to the church and the importance of it and the impact that it has. And, and I think that's an important aspect. But today we're going to broaden it a little bit. And maybe it is about giving back to God what he's given you. Maybe it is about tithing today, taking that first step of generosity. But maybe it also is a little bit broad, broadened for you today. Maybe it's about looking at your resources and having a different perspective on them. Realizing that sometimes the selfishness that creeps up or the fear and anxiety that creeps up is because we don't have a mindset and a heart that is generous towards others. And so we're going to scroll through these verses. This would be the first time in our service where I would encourage you, this is time to take notes, to, to type it out, to write it out. Whatever God's speaking to you in this moment, just take a time to reflect and think about it. So let's take a moment. Let's scroll through those verses. We'll play some music in the background, just kind of set the tone. And um, after that, I'll pray, and then we'll kind of transition to the next part of our service. So let's take a moment now. Let's read some of these verses together. Let's look at them, and let's reflect on what God's Spirit is telling us right now in this moment.
So now we've seen those verses twice, gone through them. Let's just take a moment. Let's continue to reflect. Is there one verse that stuck out to you? Is there a verse that God is impressing on your heart this morning that can bring to light some selfishness and encourage some generosity with, within you? Take a moment, reflect, type out, write out whatever God's speaking to you in this moment. So Jesus, we ask that through your word and through your spirit, would you speak to us? Would you show us with what you've given us, how you've blessed us, that we would use it and think of it not for our own purposes and our own value, God, but that we would think of it for your purposes, that you would compel our hearts to be generous in the same way that you have been generous to us. Would you continue to open up our ears and hearts to what you want us to hear from your word this morning, Jesus? We ask this in your name. Amen. Like me, I once was lost, but now I'm found. It's blind, but now I see. A great perspective to have as we talk more and more about what God has given us and what God has done for us and, and how we can share that and show that to others. Let's look at these last three verses in James chapter 5, starting in verse 4, he writes this, Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. And so, as we've already kind of alluded to, this, this, these specific verses are about the, the rich landowners, business owners of the day. They were so concerned about their wealth that even when they came to faith in Christ and maybe even began to employ some of their Christian brothers and sisters, they weren't paying them a fair wage. They were taking advantage of them and their work and their effort and once again, the, the greatest harm that's done in this equation is not against the injustice against the workers. The greatest harm is the self-harm that is done towards the owners themselves. The cries and the injustices have reached the ears of our generous God. And once again, we can look at this passage of, of Scripture and think to ourselves, well, I'm not an owner. I'm not managing, but... You know what, I think tomorrow morning as I go back into the office, I can say, hey, wretched sinner, there's some amazing grace from you as long as you pay me a fair wage. I mean, we could, we could do something like that. You may be thinking that right now. You may be thinking to yourself, well, I know some people in Springfield I'd like to talk and give a thing or two, especially in May when these property taxes come around. And I, I, yep, there's some wretchedness and they need to understand how much... We're not pointing the finger at other people this morning. We're pointing the fingers at ourselves. We're reflecting on us. And, and what's interesting is that, once again, the vivid picture that, that James paints here in these verses. Go to the verse 5. You've lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. What he's telling these owners is that you have made extra money by being unjust in your payment, and you are 
puffing yourself up. You're indulging on the wealth and the extra, the excess that you have gained and earned because of dealing with your employees unjustly. And you think that's a good thing for you. It's fattening you up. But what it's doing is it's preparing you for a day of slaughter. In a culture that was full of farm animals and in farming, it's the reminder that, and we've seen this plenty of times, that the animals that are on farms and they're eating and they're eating. They got like five meals a day. They're like, life is good. We're eating all this stuff. But they don't know that in 48 hours, they're going to be a nice steak dinner. In 48 hours, they're going to be a nice juicy cheeseburger. In 48 hours, they're going to be a cold glass of milk. Like they don't, they don't realize that. So they think they're, they're living their best life, eating all this food. But it's just in preparation for them to die. And he's saying, that's the same thing that's going on with you. You think you're enjoying this life and you're making extra money by treating your employees in unjustly, not paying them what they deserve. And it's leading to your death and destruction. In verse six, you have condemned and murdered the innocent one who is not opposing you. He's saying, you think you are putting down, you're putting down people who are not, or who are your employers or your employees. And they're not opposing you. They're not coming against you. They're not the ones that are crying out against you. They don't know that you are doing this deceitfully. You are pushing them down. They have no idea and they have no power or strength or influence to oppose you, yet you are coming after them. But then to go back to verse four, because this one would ring true so many of these believers. It alludes to this idea of, of the cries, are, 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 are the, the, the field that are crying out against you. It goes back to Genesis chapter 4 and the first murder, the first human murder in history where Cain killed his brother Abel. And God, God approaches Cain and he, he tells him, where's your brother? And he says, I don't know, I'm not my brother's keeper. I don't know where he's at. And he says, no, 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 you know. <laughs> his blood is crying out to me. And so the picture that James is saying is that you remember that first terrible act of human against human that's what's happening here. That's what you are doing to your employees. And God hears. God knows exactly what is going on. And so maybe this doesn't apply specifically with our treasure because we're not paying workers or we're not, we're not in that position. But there are some things that we do have control over, specifically our time and our talent. But sometimes we withhold from others and we use it for our own purposes and for our own pleasure instead of being a blessing and an encouragement to others. We're in complete control of those things. He's given us control to manage those things and yet sometimes in our calendars, we live, leave very little time for the needs of others. We, we pile up all the things and all the activities that we wanna do. We, we schedule things for our kids so that they get ahead, excel, and be successful. We fill our calendars to the brim. We fatten up our calendars. We utilize our time only for ourselves, not realizing that it's leading to our demise, to our death. It's leading to the slaughter. It makes us more busy, makes us more rushed, it makes us feel like we have way too much to do and not enough time to do it, and it burns us out. It drains us emotionally and physically, mentally, and spiritually. And what about our talents? The, the things that, that we're good at, our skills, maybe a hobby, an activity, a sport we're good at, an ability to work with our hands, to, to write, to communicate, whatever it is. Many times we think of these things as, well, I just want to use it for my own pleasure. I want to use this for my own enjoyment. I want to use this so I can make a little bit of extra cash, you know, a little side hustle, whatever it is. And we forget that God has given us those talents to serve and to encourage others in their lives. To, to use those things that God has gift us, gifted us in to point people back to him. We fatten ourselves up using our talents and our skills and our abilities to think that that's where I can find pleasure. The experience I can create for myself, that's where I'll gain enjoyment and fulfillment in this life. But instead, it leads us to the slaughter. 
It leads us chasing after one experience and one skill and one opportunity time and time again. And, and we forget what we are created for. We forget of how God has given those things to be generous towards others. You know, when I'm generous with my time, what I've realized, and, and I'm a person who, you know, if you look at my calendar on my phone and my computer, it's scheduled out, different meetings, appointments, whatever it is. If I don't create space where there's just margin, where there's nothing going on, when I'm not generous with my time, well, then I get frustrated about having an extra conversation with a neighbor or, or a friend because it doesn't fit up because I got this, this, and this, and this, this to do. I get frustrated when it takes a little bit longer to, to help kids with schoolwork because I got this to do and this to do and this to do. When I'm not generous with my time, I get so focused on what I have to accomplish and I forget that God wants me to have some space and opportunity so I can use my time for whatever he wants to bring on my plate. When I'm generous with my talent, I embrace the opportunities to serve and help those in need with the skills and the abilities God has given me. And so it doesn't become a burden because someone asks me to help them do something or take care of something or whatever it is because I have the space and I have the desire to help them in whatever way that I can. See, when we have a generous heart, when we live a generous life, when we view our time and our talent and our treasure, not in terms of being ours for our benefit and for our pleasure, but for God's, what it does is it leads us down a path that is life-giving, not a path that ultimately leads to destruction. We get the most out of life, most enjoyment, most contentment, most satisfaction when we are being generous with everything that God has given us. And so right now what we're going to do is we're going to reflect on some questions about our time and our talent. Questions that hopefully will make us think and, and help us remind ourselves of what Jesus said, that it's better to give than it is to receive. Yes, that's true with, with resources and, and our treasure, but it's also true with our time. It's also true with our talent. And so in the second time of reflection, there's going to be five questions that scroll through a couple times. And my, 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 my challenge to you is just ask God for one of these questions to speak to you that one of these questions would really grip your heart and mind, that you would be able to ask the Lord to speak to you, to help you answer it, and to help you take a step forward in living generously because of how you answered it. And after that, I, I will come back up here. I'll give us some time to pray and reflect, and then in a moment, we will take communion together. So if you want to take a moment now to get those elements ready, you can. And Don Womax will lead us in taking communion together, reflecting on the greatest act of generosity that God has done for us by giving us his son, Jesus. So let's take a moment now. Let's, let's look at these questions. Let's ask God to give us an answer to one, at least one. Write it down, type it out, whatever it is. And let's ask God to speak to us in this moment and help us to be generous with what he has given us in our time and our talents. Let's take this moment now to reflect.
Let's look at those questions one more time again. I take another moment and just think on and reflect on those questions. Is there one that stuck out to you? Go ahead, take a moment to write it down, type it out. If you're taking notes, let God's Spirit speak to you in this moment. So God, we ask that what you've spoken to us this morning would not just sit with us today and that's it. That it would begin to make change in our life. That we would see that our faith in you compels us to live generously. And so Lord, however you've spoken to each and every one of us this morning, through the power of your Holy Spirit working in us, would you equip us? Would you empower us? to make these changes, both mind and heart and, and how we live. We thank you, Jesus, for your word that is timeless, that speaks to us even today. We love you. And as we reflect on all that you have done for us now through the cross and through your resurrection, may it continue to compel us to generosity. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. And we ask these things in your name. Amen.